Now we're joining uh, uh, April Benesich at Rutgers University, Newark. Uh, Dr. Benesich is the director of the Infancy Studies Laboratory at the Center for Molecular and Behavioral Neuroscience. So welcome, Dr. Benesich. Thank you. Glad to be with you today. Good, good. Well, um, so uh, I understand that you study how babies' brains organize to develop language. Can you tell us about your work? I certainly can. And I just wanted to mention that at the Center for Molecular and Behavioral Neuroscience, where I do my research, we study the brain from all different levels, from neurotransmitters up to behavioral neuroscience. We study Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and health in African Americans and how you can lower blood pressure. So we have lots of very interesting things going on at the center. My work focuses on understanding what's happening inside the baby's brain. So how does the brain begin to organize in order to set up the most optimal um, network to, 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 to acquire their native language? And so we see babies prospectively in one to two weeks, so we get them when they're two or three months old, and some kids we followed out till 10, 11, 12, so we just follow out to five years, but we're able to map what's happening in the brain and how that relates to how the children do later on in educational sense, in an educational sense, so with language and with cognitive ability. Um, so, so, um, so, uh, in terms of the applications of your research and uh, the way in which it is being used both by your by your center and and other academics um, across the country, can you can you talk a little bit about about those applications? Sure, I can. And actually, I brought print. I brought our new um, prototype for our technology transfer. It's called the RAFT, Rapid Auditory Processing Technology, ABBY. And um, we've published a number of papers, one really big one at the end of 2014, suggesting that by engaging babies, engaging babies in um, uh, hearing sounds in the environment and focusing them on little perturbations in sound in the tens of milliseconds, that's kind of like language, that we can get them to optimize their brain networks at the point where they're actually um, beginning to set up their native language. When babies are newborn, they can process the sounds of every single language in the world, any language, because their brain doesn't know what's going to happen. It's got to be open to everything. And as babies grow, they basically narrow their perception of sounds to the native language and then sort of push aside and don't respond as much to sounds that are not within their native language. So they, they make these auditory maps, these maps in the brain that are auditory maps. Um, and those maps let you process efficiently and, um, and talk with someone in real time in this very efficient way. Um, some babies don't do that well, and when they don't do it well, they end up with disorders like specific language impairment, dyslexia, um, the language issues that you have with autism. And so we are able to predict when babies are going to have these kinds of problems by looking at their brains early on and looking at how these brain maps are organizing using electroencephalography, the stretching that, that we put on the baby's head. And we also use naturally speaking MRI. And so we figured out a way to, to actually um, predict how well babies are going to be doing at four, five, and six years of age by looking from three to six months. So that's very nice. You can know whether they're going to be a standard deviation above the norm or a standard de deviation below. You know, they're going to have problems because their brain's set up in a particular way that's not quite optimal. It's like having a messy outlet where you have lots of plugs and it's all garbled in a big knot. And in order to, well, I guess electricity doesn't work that way, but it's not as efficient. <laughs> clean network. Um, and so this helps babies to do it. We sort of support them while they're actually doing it. And how do we do that? We expose them to sounds that have um, changes that might be language, not sounds that are linguistic, not sounds that are language. So we keep the brain open to all languages. And we figured out a way to actually do that in the lab. 
And we wanted to be able to take something and to do technology transfer, which Rutgers is very um, enthusiastic about. And we wanted something we could have in every home or every clinic or in the doctor's office. And so we've been working on this prototype, which was mostly supported by donations from people who are uh, passionate about children and about helping them to succeed in the world and to avoid the problems that come with language learning disorders. Um, and so I'm going to turn Abby on. And we don't have the baby in front of it, but um, can you still see me when I stand up? Um, we actually do okay. not see your face. Okay, now you can see me. Okay. Now if you're sitting, we, we can see you all, yes. Okay, so Abby is designed to have a baby sitting in front of it. It's moving up now. Um, and there are two um, guide uh, lights on the top. And when the baby looks at it, we put the baby in a little seat in front of it. It talks. It captures the baby's eye gaze. And so once the baby's eye gaze is captured, and we can tell that by these lights here, the baby can just make this whole program work by moving their eyes. So this is a video to get the baby engaged and looking in this direction. And once that's over, you'll hear a series of sounds that will be easy first, a sound, and then a sound will change. And when the sound changes, the baby will get reinforced with a little video here. And as soon as Elmo stops singing, which I'm sure you're just enjoying immensely, um, <laughs> the program will start, and um, you'll be able to see that there'll be a signal that comes up here to capture the baby's attention, and a series of sounds that vary in the tens of milliseconds. And so we're basically doing something called the operant conditioning. We're training the baby that when the sound changes a little bit, something exciting is going to happen. And so we can have the baby do this. It's like a little game the baby can play. But we've also found that there. I, can you hear those sounds? Barely. We okay. can barely hear it. Okay. So there was just a change. It went beep, beep, beep. Yeah, now we can hear it better. And so the baby gets reinforced. Did you hear that difference? Mm -hmm. So yes. to start with, it's very easy. And so we're training the baby. The sound changes, something exciting happens here. And as the program goes on, based on whether the baby gets it right or wrong, um, we make it harder. And we make the, the discrimination uh, more and more difficult. And we actually did something like this in the lab. On, EEG control, but this can do it in the home. And we found that babies who interacted with something like this for six to seven minutes once a week for six weeks had much faster, more efficient naps, and their brains were working much more efficiently. And so we're very excited. This is our first prototype. We're getting ready to look for a corporate partner. Um, but we really believe that even we found in our studies that even babies who are typically developing and don't have any history of language problems, which actually predicts to children that have language learning disorders in the family, like a sibling or a parent or a grandparent, are 30 to 60% more likely to have a disorder themselves. And it's mostly based on a, a large subset of it's based on their inability to identify these little sounds in the environment and to encode them. And so this is designed to help them, but it also helps infants who have no history of language learning impairment. Um, it seems to help them to make more efficient maps. So we're supporting the baby while they're doing what they do naturally in the environment. And it seems to be very beneficial. So, well, yes. That, you know, that's, a, that's an incredible um, an incredible story to, to tell. I'm taking very complicated science and, and explaining it in ways that, that I think all, um, everybody can understand the kind of work that, that you're doing. Uh, you, you, are also, uh, you also are the Solomon Chair holder. Um, can you talk a little bit about the importance of, of that philanthropy to, uh, to the work that you do? Well, one of the exciting things is um, 
one of the major donors to the Solomon Chair is, um, is Elizabeth Solomon, someone who is very passionate about language learning disorders and children's uh, progress in general. And the reason this chair was established, it was part of the matching grant that was done for these 13 chairs. Um, a, a foundation also contributed half a million dollars. The excitement of that is that the type of research that I'm doing that's basically looking at make that quiet. Um, the type of research that I'm doing that actually looks at how the brain organizes and what that means in terms of children later on at two, three, four, five years of age up through college, you can predict how they're going to be doing by getting them the right start early on in life. And this type of research is very difficult to do. It's very expensive. Um, mm -hmm. But because you follow babies for a long period of time, you have to see a lot of children. You know, you're doing EPD, you're doing fMRI, which is expensive. Um, and the thinking for this chair was that this type of work should go on in perpetuity, that there should be people that are um, working in this area. And it's, and it's an emerging area. It's a fairly new discipline, developmental cognitive neuroscience, where you're actually looking at development, you're looking at the brain, and you're looking at how you can figure out the way the brain is configuring across age. And so this chair was just, first of all, very, very exciting. It's the first chair in developmental cognitive neuroscience in the country. Um, wow. The first chair in arts and sciences here in the country. And um, most of the people involved were women. Yay! So <laughs> we were really, really pleased about that because we want women, we want everyone to be excited about science. Uh, we want everyone to be excited about technology and engineering and to get involved in it at a very young age. We're starting in two to three months. We think we can really come with a cadre of young women and men who want to start doing neuroscience at 12, 13 maybe. But I think this chair supports that type of research and makes sure that this emerging area is always part of the research that's going on here at, at Rutgers and Rutgers in general and in Rutgers University. One of the thing, one of the things I, I find really exciting about what you shared about the gift that um, Elizabeth Solomon and the foundation made is that in in funding this chair, uh, they really follow their their personal passions, um, and uh, and and Rutgers is uh, is complex enough and has enough superstars like you um, doing important work that. Almost any person who has an interest in seeing the world become a better place, there's an avenue for that philanthropy. And, and it's great that Elizabeth Solomon found that avenue in the work that you're doing. Um, I, I agree. And I think that um, I have people who make donations to the lab who, who see, we've gotten a lot of media coverage, who see something um, in Time Magazine or on ABC News or whatever. And they, they find my email. Of course, April Benesich is so good because nobody else has that name. They just type it in. <laughs> All that stuff comes up. It's not like it's the Sam Jones. Um, and they email me, and they we often get into a dialogue about how important this sort of thing is. And, and very often, donations come about in that way. Um, I also am excited about the push to get alumni more involved. Um, and to understand the exciting things that are coming out of Rutgers in not just science and technology, but in literature and art and music. Um, so it's, it's a very exciting place to be. And um, I wouldn't be at Rutgers if it wasn't, because I'm also, you know, everybody has opportunities to go elsewhere. And people say, oh, why would you be in Newark? Well, this has been the most supportive environment. Um, Chancellor Cantor is excited about my work. Um, and lots of other people are very supportive. And that's critically important, that excitement, because that helps you continue to do the kind of work that you're doing and it brings donors in. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Benesich, I want to just thank you for spending so much time with us today. And um, I encourage our listeners who are excited by the work um, of Dr. Benesich and her, uh, her center to go online and make a commitment 
uh, to her work today uh, on Rutgers' first um, annual giving day. Thanks a lot, Dr. Benesich. Thank you.